Hello, I'm Lydia Prosser, Curator of Medieval Archaeology and History, and I'm going to take you on a short tour through the medieval galleries here at the National Museum of Scotland. We'll linger on a few well-known pieces, as well as a couple of my personal favourites. We begin here in the entrance hall to the Kingdom of the Scots exhibition on Level 1. This room is called Scotland Defined, and I think it gives a clear picture of what this exhibition sets out to do, chart the development of Scotland into the nation we know today, placing the start of its trajectory in the early medieval period and taking us up to the Union of Scotland and England in 1707. And the late medieval period in particular has been seen as a key time of consolidation and foundation within this broader narrative. On the banner ahead of us are some of the themes that are typically focused on when people consider this period, including kingship, urbanisation and institutional religion. And around the walls is a quotation from the Declaration of Arbroath, the letter sent to the Pope in 1320 by Scottish nobles asking him to recognise Scotland's independence and acknowledge Robert the Bruce as Scotland's lawful king. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. The first object that I want to look at takes us way back into the 8th century. It's made from wood faced with copper alloy and silver plates with these exquisite enamelled mounts. And you can just make out the beautiful incised animals curving round on these silver plates. And I should emphasise how tiny this object is, it's just over 11 centimetres across and 9 centimetres high. But what is it? The object is a reliquary, a box to house saintly relics, although unfortunately the contents of this example have long since been lost. One hinge remained, but there would have been two originally, and these probably attached a strap, allowing the object to be carried, possibly around the neck. A tradition grew around the reliquary in the 19th century, identifying it as the Breckbanach of St Columba, a standard carried before the Scottish army in battle, including at the Battle of Bannockburn, and actually you may recognise the Monmusk reliquary from some Scottish £20 notes which includes it in this context. In reality, we don't know much at all about the reliquary's history, and the association with the Breckbanach is now seen as unlikely. But the object remains an important part of Scotland's story, and its ability to inspire people endures. We'll encounter other objects that have legends associated with them in the course of this tour. The Monny Musk Reliquary was made at a time when Scotland was a medley of kingdoms and peoples, and the style of the reliquary reflects influence from three of these, the Gaels, the Picts and the Northumbrians. The Picts did not leave us with much written material, but they had a rich material culture, including hundreds of carved stones such as this one. The assimilation of the Pictish and Gaelic polities from the mid-9th century and the rise of the Kingdom of Alba marked the beginning of a process that would result by the end of the late medieval period in something that geographically broadly corresponds to modern Scotland. It's easy when looking backwards in time to map a straight line from the past to the present, but the reality was much more convoluted. Norse and Gaelic rulers of the Western Isles gave way to the semi-independent Lords of the Isles, who fiercely championed their interests from a base at Finlagan on the Isle of Isla, and these cases contain objects from excavations there. The Monymusk Reliquary, amazingly, survived the Viking attacks that were first recorded in Scotland from the end of the 8th century. This was soon followed by settlement, and the Northern Isles and Hebrides remained under the control of Norway until well into the late medieval period, with substantial Scandinavian as well as Irish influence extending across the western seaboard. Meanwhile, a new European influence was reflected in many of the objects and architectural styles that appeared in Scotland from the 12th century, corresponding with wider developments such as the minting of coins and the establishment of burrs. These stone fragments from Jedburgh Abbey, which date from the 12th to early 13th century, display one of these new architectural styles, commonly referred to as Romanesque. Such international connections form the background for the next group of objects that I want to consider, the Lewis chess pieces. These pieces were found on the Isle of Lewis in 1831. 93 pieces were found in total from at least four chess sets, along with counters for a game called Tables, which was similar to Monday Backgammon, and a buckle. The National Museum curates 11 pieces in total, including two kings, three queens, three bishops, one knight and two warders, with the rest in the British Museum's collection. The pieces are believed to date to the late 12th to early 13th century. Each figure is skillfully carved from walrus ivory or sperm whale tooth, and I love their engaging if rather enigmatic facial expressions. People have come up with a number of different theories about what emotions are conveyed by these pieces. Were they intended to be comical or satirical? Or maybe reflect sadness at the destruction caused by warfare? Boredom, perhaps, at the amount of time the game is taking? Frenzy and excitement seems a good interpretation in some instances. What do you think? There is much about the chess pieces that is enigmatic. The written accounts of their discovery are conflicting and leave many questions to be answered. 
Where exactly on Lewis were they found? How did they end up there? Where was their intended destination? Who owned them? It's not possible to provide a specific answer to many of these, although it seems that the chess pieces were the stock of a travelling salesperson, and they likely originated from Trondheim in Norway. They may have been destined for rich consumers in the west of Scotland, the Isle of Man, Ireland, or even Lewis itself. Originating in the Islamic world, chess was a popular leisure pursuit among the elite classes in medieval Scotland, and we will come across more evidence of medieval board games in the course of this tour. If we walk through this doorway on the right, we enter a gallery called Monarchy and Power and are arrested immediately by this beautiful object. This is the Butte Mesa, which is on long-term loan to the museum from the Butte Collection on Mount Stuart. A mesa is a communal drinking vessel which was passed around at feasts and other occasions. The bowl is made from maple wood with silver embellishments and a silver gilt boss at the bottom. At the centre of the boss we can see a lion with red enamel eyes surrounded by six enamelled shields. And if we come round to the back of the case, there is also a beautifully carved whalebone lid. Only the boss is certainly medieval. The silver fittings and lid were added in the 16th century, probably for Ninian Bannatyne of Came, who is named on the inscription that runs around the rim. The shields display the heraldic arms of nobles from southwest Scotland, and the line in the centre likely represents Robert the Bruce. The Mesa was probably commissioned by one of the nobles whose shields are depicted, perhaps Walter Stuart, whose shield sits between the line's paws. Stuart married the Bruce's daughter Marjorie in around 1315, and the Mesa may have been produced to celebrate this marriage. If so, it was made just after the decisive Battle of Bannockburn in June 1314, when the heavily outnumbered Scots routed the English army of Edward II. It is a strong statement of support from these six nobles, some of whom also later added their names to the Declaration of Arbroath. This loyalty to the king was not to be taken for granted, however. One of the nobles representing the shields, Walter Fitzgerbert, did not join Robert's cause until after Bannockburn, and indeed you could argue that the Mesa may instead have been commissioned by the Fitzgerberts to emphasise their newfound loyalty to the king. Robert had come to power by violent and controversial means, and it was an ongoing effort to consolidate this victory and his hard-won position as Scotland's king. We can't be sure what the original use of the boss was, but it may have functioned as the lid of another drinking vessel. If so, it would have been an integral element within a performative communal act that served to strengthen and refresh these connections and loyalties that were so important in sustaining Robert the Bruce's reign. The addition of the bowl, lid and silver embellishments in the 16th century demonstrate to us that this object was a composite piece which gained new significances and associations over time, something we've already seen with the Monimusk reliquary. Likewise, the legend of Robert the Bruce has evolved over time and we can question what objects such as the Butte Mesa mean for us today. How do we frame the actions and achievements of Robert the Bruce along with those of his predecessor William Wallace and their dominant positions in the narrative of Scotland's past? Consideration of the Butte Mesa leads us nicely onto this case, which contains objects from Threve Castle in Dumfries and Galloway. Threve Castle was the seat of the Douglas family, and the shield of Sir James Douglas appears at the right paw of the lion on the Butte Mesa. This favoured position no doubt reflected his importance to Robert the Bruce. Indeed, just before he died, Robert requested that Douglas take his heart to the Holy Land, in recognition of which the Douglas arms gained a heart. As a side note, the lack of a heart on the shield of the Mesa is additional evidence that dates within the lifetime of the Bruce. The heart is apparent, however, on this large and rather wonderful wooden platter. The rest of the objects in this case have all come from excavations at Threve Castle and represent the general accretements of daily life in medieval Scotland. I like this case because it reminds us that while most of the objects in our collections cannot be associated with a specific personal historical event, they can provide us with information such as what people ate, what they wore, how they identified themselves, how they spent their time and what they believed. On the right here at the bottom is more evidence of ball gaming, counters inexpensively made from shale. We also see leather shoes, iron keys, buckles and lead spindle whirls used to spin yarn for clothing. There's a real mixture here of the expensive and the inexpensive, the special and the everyday. And these two objects are rather more special. One is a silver gilt reliquary in the shape of a cross. The other is a silver locket inscribed with IHS, the monogram of the holy name of Jesus. These date to the 15th century and were high status, expensive objects. But we jump now to personal devotional objects at the other end of the scale. These stairs lead to a gallery which contains a case with pilgrim souvenirs, and I want to focus on one object on display in particular. 
This is one half of a stone mould for casting devotional badges. Molten metal would have been poured down these channels and set in two designs, one of Christ on the cross and the other of St Andrew on his saltire cross. Such moulds were designed to produce large numbers of objects cheaply and efficiently, and experimental archaeology has shown that thousands of badges could have been produced in a single mould like this in just a few days. The market for these badges were pilgrims travelling to the shrine at St Andrews. There was a free ferry crossing for pilgrims at North Berwick, as well as a pilgrim's hospice run by Cistercian nuns, and the mould was recovered from the churchyard of St Andrew's Church in North Berwick, which was, at that time, part of the nunnery. The nuns of North Berwick were wealthy and active in the affairs of the Burr, and it seems that they may have been involved in producing and selling souvenirs to the pilgrims. They certainly had a ready consumer base at hand. The picture presented by this mould is thus of a bustling urban environment with wide-scale production of affordable objects in a range of styles and materials, purchased by a clientele who had both the ability to travel as well as the disposable income to spend, and all these things distinguish the late medieval period. The religious objects we have seen demonstrate the extent to which religious belief played an important role in the lives of everyone in medieval Scotland, from the king to the lowliest peasant. That was a whistle-stop tour and I wish I could show you more. If you've enjoyed this tour, you can do some exploring of your own from home through Google Street View or by visiting the galleries in Edinburgh.